You know, one of the highlights during Asbury's Christmas singing season was singing the 12 days of Christmas at Azalea Land Nursing Home. We tackled the long and wordy Christmas carol with great gusto. Each time we sang a new day, a new verse of the 12 days of Christmas, I would randomly point to one of the carolers in our group and that person would tell us what the new gift was for that day. And then everyone would join in after they did their one solo line. The residents at Azalea Land loved it, got a big kick out of it. There was a loud applause at the end. We reveled in our accomplishment. You know, most people have heard the 12 days of Christmas their entire life and not realized that it's about the time period we are in right now. Since we are a culture based on the economy and making sales, most people relate the song to the 12 days before Christmas or the 12 days left for shopping before Christmas. But that's not it at all. Christmas Day is the first day of Christmas, followed by 11 more days of Christmas. Today is the seventh day of Christmas. Ray, what did your true love give to you on the seventh day of Christmas? Seven swans swimming. Apart I just asked what you were getting today. <laughs> they are known for getting carried away, that choir of ours. The day after the twelfth day of Christmas is January 6th. And in the Christian calendar, January 6th, is called the Day of Epiphany. And just as Christmas has a signature story of the birth of Christ, and just as Easter has a signature story of the resurrection, and as Pentecost has the signature story of the flaming tongues coming upon the disciples, the Day of Pentecost has its own signature story. And it's the story of the Magi, the wise men, coming to visit the Christ child. Hallmark, artists making paintings, and others of us, like today, often combine the story of Christmas and Epiphany. They have the shepherds and the wise men all lumped together at the manger. But when the Magi arrived, Jesus is no longer a newborn baby. And the Holy Family is no longer in a stable. They are in some kind of house. The word epiphany means discovery, manifestation. Aha, I've had an epiphany. I've had a discovery. Something hidden has been revealed. It's a wonderful world. Try saying it with me. Epiphany. Doesn't that feel good? It's a great word. The overriding message of the Epiphany story is that God has made an appearance and has been discovered. Aha! That, of course, is special. But what makes this this appearance especially special is that it's an appearance to and a discovery by Gentiles. Mary and Joseph were Jews, Jewish. The shepherds coming to the manger, they were Jewish. The Magi were not Jewish. 
The story of the Magi revealed that God not only cared for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, for all people. Now that may be old news to you and me, but not to the early Christians. Christianity, of course, grew out of Judaism. The first Christians were Jews, and at first they did not encourage Gentiles to join them in following Christ. But part of the epiphany, part of the discovery here, is that God and Christ are not only for Jews, but for everyone. That was a big aha. So the writer of the Gospel of Matthew introduces Jesus by way of a story that shatters religious traditions and brings strangers, outsiders, into the spotlight. It is here at the very beginning of the Jesus story. And as you know, before this story is over, Jesus will shatter all of the old boundaries of religion and race and social class and status and gender. Before this story is over, all of the outsiders, the marginal, the unclean, lepers, tax collectors, prostitutes, poor people, women, children, foreigners, Roman centurions, all of them outsiders will be part of the story will be welcomed and included in his company, welcomed at his table. Before it's over, Jesus will scandalize the most pious, orthodox religious leaders of his people by his radical inclusivity. He doesn't know an outsider, doesn't understand that one of the so-called functions of religion is to define the tribe, draw lines between us and them, and to build walls of doctrine and practice to keep us away from them, keep them out. Doesn't understand that way of thinking at all. He tears down the walls, crosses the boundaries, flings the doors wide open and welcomes everyone home. And it begins here, today, with the Magi. We actually don't know much about them, these men from the East. Over the years, they have been called Magi, wise men, astronomers, scientists, astrologers. The text says they're from the East, but we're not sure exactly sure where in the East. We don't know how many Magi there were. The number three comes to us through legend because there were, there were three types of gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. Six Magi could have been carrying gold. Nine of them frankincense and 50 of them myrrh could have been 65 kings. We 65 kings of Orient are, right? No, let's keep it a small number, a one-syllable word that fits better in the song. Maybe that's how we got the number three. We don't know much about these guys, these magi. What we do know is that they traveled very far to a foreign land to discover truth to grow in their understanding of God. They're open to learning from people who were not just like them, who even claimed another faith, another tradition, another religion, another truth. And as we start a new year, I would suggest that we follow their lead. I realize that many of us here at Asbury see ourselves as pretty open-minded people, and that's good. But let me remind you that it's real easy for us to get comfortable, to settle. No matter how open and inclusive we feel we are, our human tendency is to be comfortable, to think our way is best. 
so it's easy not to explore, not to take the journey. If we are wise, if we're to grow in our faith, if we are to find God in various places, then we need to do what the wise men did. We need to take pilgrimages. Not just physical pilgrimages. I realize that some of us are not in situations where we can take physical pilgrimages. But the Magi's pilgrimage was more of a spiritual adventure. So think of it that way. We can all take spiritual adventures. We can all stretch and journey to new spiritual places. It may be a journey to a Bible study or a journey to getting no people in your neighborhood. It may be trying a new method of prayer. It may be learning about a new religion. It may simply be reaching out to someone you don't know at coffee hour. Keep taking the journeys, the spiritual adventures that enable you to have epiphanies. Especially epiphanies of the Christ, of love. There was another reason these wise men took this pilgrimage. They took it so they could pay homage. They made the journey. They made this great effort as you did on this New Year's cold morning so that they could offer their respect and their admiration so that they could worship Him. And again, if we are to have a great year, if we're, we want to experience life in its fullness in 2018, it's important to make the journey week after week after week to pay homage to God. The Magi recognize that there is one who is more important than they are. One who is deserving of their worship, their praise, their time, their gifts. The scriptures tell us that this is the beginning of wisdom. Recognizing that God is God. Acknowledging, as our 12 steppers put it, that there is a higher power, a power greater than ourselves. The scriptures tell us that this is the first step to having wisdom, the first step to being wise guys and wise gals. You've done a really good thing by taking this pilgrimage to church this morning by you recognizing God this higher power you are firmly on the path to wisdom when we make this pilgrimage two important and two paradoxical things happen within us first of all we experience humility we recognize there is something bigger than us, something greater than us, something we depend on, that we can't do it alone by ourselves. At the same time, however, we are empowered because we know that we're not alone. We know that the creator of the universe loves us and cares for us. So we experience both humility and empowerment. That's an incredible combination, a winning combination as you move into the new year. So I encourage you to keep taking this journey through 2018 to pay homage to this one who is greater than we are. Make it a habit, a routine. I know that we can worship God while we're standing on mountains overlooking God's beautiful creation. I know we can worship God on the beach as we overlook the endless ocean. 
Those can be renewing and transformative spiritual experiences. I know that. But they do not replace the communal aspect of worshiping God. We don't know how many magi there were, but we know that there was more than one. Nothing can replace the communal aspect of paying homage to God. I often tell the story about the rabbi's child who used to like to wander through the woods. And at first, the father let his son take this little stroll, but the child started taking more and more time in the woods. And Father Rabbi realized that it might be dangerous for his son, so he decided to talk it over with the boy. He said, son, I've noticed that every day you walk in the woods, and I wonder, why do you go there? And the child said, I go there to find God. (laughs) That's a very good thing, said the father. I'm glad you're searching for God, but my child... Don't you know that God is the same everywhere? Yes, the child said, but I'm not. God is the same everywhere, but you and I are not. I'm not the same and you're not the same when we enter this sanctuary and we, when we come to this table and when we come among a community of seekers. When we come to worship, when we offer our gifts, when we kneel at the table, we know that God is here ready to embrace us and love us and help us to be our true selves. We come and take communion with diverse people who are in various places in their faith journey. And to the degree that you and I come here to know ourselves forgiven, loved, and freed, we are to go forth to be God's people in God's world. There's nothing like it, and nothing can replace it. I am a person filled with flaws. You know that. I get depressed. I get filled with anxiety, just like everyone else. I can worry with the best of them. But I am fortunate because I am in a job that requires me to dig into the scriptures, that requires me to study biblical passages, to read theologians and biblical scholars every single week. And it fills me up with positive, inspiring teachings and messages every week. Then I am required to come here every Sunday and come among wonderful people seeking to love God and to love other people. And this does amazing things for me. I'm scared to think where I would be if I didn't experience God among this faith community each day weak. If I didn't have this job, I would be a mess. I don't know how people do it. I'm concerned about people who don't have this gift, this blessing of a faith community week after week. I'm concerned about families. I'm concerned about young people. I'm concerned about our society because we are no longer keeping the Sabbath holy. We now have soccer practices on Sunday mornings. Kids play on baseball teams all year long, often making weekend road trips. People are so busy, they act too tired to come to church. So many people no longer paying homage to God regularly. And our society is suffering for it. And individually, we are suffering. Preston Hodges, our lay leader and one of our wise men, has been encouraging me to work out, to get in shape. And I told Preston, I'm turning over a new leaf. Starting tomorrow, January 1st. I'm going to commit myself to becoming physically fit, stronger, thinner, faster, meaner, and leaner. (laughs) I promised him that I would work out, get this, once 
or twice a month. <laughs> what you think about that? <laughs> and I'm so dedicated now to being fit, I may even make it to the gym or pool three times a month. If I said that to Preston, he would do what you just did. <laughs> but that's how many of us approach our spiritual fitness, which is quite ironic since the physical world is not our ultimate reality. Our ultimate reality is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. The wise men were in really good shape. They were incredibly spiritually fit. And one of the things that happens when you're in good spiritual shape is you're able to sense the guidance of God. And that's what happened to them. Singer James Taylor reminds us in that wonderful song of his that the wise men went home by another way. They sensed God calling them to go in a different direction that they had planned to go. They were able to be flexible. And of course, it saved the life of Christ since they were open to the movement of God's Spirit, since they were spiritually fit and listening. They were able to experience epiphany. That's what church does for us. That's what church is. A place full of star followers. Seeking epiphanies. Manifestations of God. It is not over by poet Anne Weems. It is not over this birthing. There are always newer skies into which God can throw stars. When we begin to think that we can predict the advent of God, that we can box the Christ in a stable in Bethlehem, that's just the time that God will be born in a place we can't imagine and won't believe. Those who wait for God watch with their hearts and not their eyes, listening, always listening, for angel words. God bless you. God bless me as we move into 2018, becoming spiritually fit so we can listen to God and experience epiphanies. Let us pray. God of star watchers, God of star followers, you call us to ventures untried, to paths untrodden and perils unknown. Guide us and empower us. Let us be alert for epiphanies. Give to us the spirit of our Lord Jesus throughout the coming days and year. In Christ's name, amen.